seats. I think we're uh, just about ready to get started. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly um, orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aviana Baldwin Jefferson. Uh, so Dr. Baldwin Jefferson is um, one of our current fourth year residents. She's our first resident speaker of this um, academic year, which is great. Uh, she's originally from Pittsburgh um, and then went to Duke for her undergrad um, and studied um, evolutionary um, anthropology. Um, and then um, after that, she also minored in um, education. And um, after finishing undergrad, she uh, taught at an all boys school in Chicago um, and then um, went to medical school at University of Rochester. She was drawn there by uh, their um, focus on the biopsychosocial model of medicine. Um, and then during medical school, um, she received um, funding from Nth Dimensions and um, mentoring support and was able to work with um, Dr. Resfin, Mesfin. Um, and she did uh, spine research at that point, which um, sparked an interest that has led her here today. Uh, so she is an aspiring spine surgeon. She's continued uh, working with our spine group here. Uh, she's uh, very interested in the social de determinants of healthcare um, and has done a lot of great work in that area. Uh, today, she'll be speaking to us on medical mistrust, uh, where we've been, where we are, where we can be. So Dr. Baldwin Jefferson, thank you and uh, look forward to your talk. All right. Hello, this is the uh, Baldwin Jefferson debut, so still getting used to the name. <laughs> okay, so hello, and thank you for having me today. The fourth year Grand Rounds is a pivotal moment in the residency journey, so I'm happy to be here right now. Today, we will be talking about a topic that I've had on my mind for a while, and residency has given me the language and opportunity to speak on the topic, medical mistrust. We will focus on its history, current events, and providing care and I have no disclosures to make at this time. The more I dove into the field, the more I realized its vastness. So this hour will serve as an overview. We will start by defining medical mistrust. We will then understand the historical context as the factual history is a key component in distinguishing medical mistrust from other concepts like conspiracy theories and delusions. We will then discuss the current history in order to show that this is a concept that is not just a problem of our grandparents. After establishing the context, we will move into understanding medical mistrust beyond a social issue. This will focus on the negative impact medical mistrust has on patient outcomes. We will then end solution-oriented, how to understand and, and how to understand a possible patient difficult, difficult encounter and how we can begin to push past those barriers. But with any topic that involves difficult subject matter, I always think it is important to take a moment. So, so I'd like everyone to present, present and on Zoom to take a pause and think of the following questions. When you saw the title, what were your initial thoughts, both positive and negative? Do you feel this topic pertains to you and impacts you? Do you have any strong emotions pertaining to this topic? I would like you to keep how you are coming into this lecture in the back of your mind as we proceed. So we're gonna start with the poll and we have multiple avenues because we're in technology age in, a, in San Francisco for you to enter the poll. You can use the web, you can text, or you can use this fancy QR code, QRL code. <laughs> oh, uh oh, still need, okay. <laughs> Sorry. It might be, or what we can do, this is what we're gonna do also for people because um, unfortunately the embedding is not working. So as any things, we're gonna on the fly do some AV. And this will at least have your text options. Oh, there we go. Can everyone see that? Oh, great. So challenging already seems to be a big one. Race, Tuskegee, Henrietta, unethical, marginalization, disparities, frustration, 
see, lacks racism, systemic, gen general, misinformation, discordance, embedded, underserved, vaccines history, language, COVID, populations, charged, abuse, Okay, so I think we've kind of gotten most of the words out. And I thank you for your participation and also the variety of words here. And as you can see, as I was mentioning before, this is a topic that is not easily talk, discussed and not necessarily easily understood. So we're gonna give my computer a second to remember. And now, what are the roles, identities, and characteristics with what you identify? And this I just want you to think about and own in the back of your mind, because yet again, these are the things and how you are presenting um, to the patient and to the world. And so for me, some things I began to think about as I prepared this, this talk, and to make sure that I know are present, are the things that I can control, which are on the right, physician, surgeon, advocate, wife, and the things that I cannot control. How I present visually, black, women, American, and child of a single income household. And I'm sure there are very more, many more I could have identified. And so now we are ready to define medical mistrust, now that we're in the correct mindset to begin this talk. Medical mistrust is typically described in two buckets, systemic or group and interpersonal. As depicted here, there's often overlap between the two. On the systemic level, medical mistrust is typically group-based. This can be based in, this basis can be rooted in geographic origins, identified heritage, social institution, like an identified group based on race, sexuality, ideology, or systemic disparities, like groups created from shared oppression. And so here, I have a couple flags, which may be, oh, there's the light. So on the top here, I have the women's rights flag, the black unity flag, and our LGBTQAI flags, which are all, sent, all flags meant to unify people that have been oppressed. Therefore, the group, that shares this generalized information, sorry. Therefore the group shares generalized and um, information is passed down based upon feelings of lack of trust that lead to a concern that medical care will not be delivered in the group's best interest. This lack of trust is typically reactionary to the society in which the dominant culture creates and sustains isms, stigmas, and phobias. For example, if I were a black male from the American South, I have been raised with lessons as protection against the racism my people have faced that may lead me to mistrust. On an interpersonal level, medical mistrust is defined to be based on one's individual or personal experiences. These individual experiences lead to a belief that the medical system is not going to work in one's best interest. So here you can see Vision. As a robot, he is starting from a blank slate and does not have an identified group. His individual experiences will shape how he sees the medical field. Also, medical mistrust is not the same as distrust, which is simply the opposite of trust. The mis prefix indicates bad or wrong, changing the definition to a lack of confidence. But, I must return to our initial Venn diagram, where you can see that a person can hold mistrust as both a group and interpersonal based. And now I'll use myself as an example. As I do have a personal interest in this topic, and the more I read about medical mistrust, the more I've been able to reflect on my personal history. So these are my grandparents, they're awesome. My grandparents are a large part of my upbringing, 
and have always been full of life lessons. From my Nana in her church chat here, she often shared her experiences with societal institutions and expressed concern that people in charge would not look out for the best interest of black people given the history of racism and oppression. My grandfather, a strong, big, caring man, has always had an aversion and fear of doctors and medicine that he has never been able to really vocalize or understand. And that has brought, to me, brought me back to why I chose medicine. Here I am at the age of 10, about, I was involved in a kitchen accident where a pot of boiling water landed on my back. During this journey, there were three events that deeply shaped me. The first two occurred in the emergency department. So my mom was not allowed into the room and I was very confused by this, but I learned without any questions asked, the assumption was made that this was a case of child abuse and therefore they did not allow her to be by my side, even as I asked for her. Since I couldn't have my mom, I called out for the next best thing, the doctor, right? I'm at the hospital. As I knew that person could and would help me. I also called for pain medications. I was met by multiple warnings by the nurse that I was too loud, needed to be more respectful of others in the hospital. I still did not receive pain medication. After being treated with skin grafts for my second and third degree burns, it was time to follow up with my surgeon. To, my, to me and my mom, it appeared that my donor site was not healing properly. The skin was very irritable and raw. It tended to ooze and occasionally had a small odor. My surgeon informed us that this was most likely healing differently due to my black skin. He felt that it was different and wasn't quite sure about the healing differences and potential of black skin as he wasn't familiar with treating it. It was in that moment that even my 10 year old self knew that did not make any sense. When my mom and I nodded, and we left. At that moment, I made the decision to become a surgeon so that others would, like me, would not be met with such misinformation. So to put in Jordan's words, I took it personally. And that is why I take this work personally. It is why I take the way we treat patients and the way we listen to patients and the way we present the patients very personally. But the purpose of this talk is not for my personal anecdote, it is to share the work that is being done within the field. In order to do that, we must first understand possible origins for mistrust. So now, it should be the same link, the same QR code. I'm gonna ask the next question is, please, and some of you already began with the I saw words of Henrietta and Tuskegee, but please share some additional examples, if you know of any, um, of historical injustices in healthcare. All right, if, give me a second if you're not able to answer. All right, let me know if you're not able to respond or maybe there, you should be able to act, respond now. If it's not working, please let me know. Good, okay, awesome. So for those who are responding, I see Tuskegee, syphilis, eugenics, Henrietta Lacks, Nazi experiments on prisoners, birth control trials in Puerto Rico, Angel Island, Tuskegee, Willowbrook hepatitis experiments, Tuskegee, 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 prison experiments, gynecological sur surgery, Tuskegee, Gila cells, Hamrana Lax, J and J vaccine, mass sterilization of black women, forced sterilization, Tuskegee, radiation girls. Tuskegee, access to care, 
public versus private for sterilization. Treatment of HIV patient. Okay, looks like we're stopping. I will say there are a few of here that I will not touch on this talk. And so if anyone feels comfortable voicing, um, explaining to me or to the, sorry, to the audience, the Willowbrook hepatitis experiments, Angel Island, birth control trials in Puerto Rico. As I wanna make sure that everyone feels heard within this talk and unfortunately, given the timeline and the time constraints, we are not able to go over everything. But if I'm comfortable sharing, I can of course move on. I'll give you a second to think. Oh, sorry, one second. Oh, um, the Willowbrook experiments were examples of doing infectious disease testing on children with developmental delays who were unable to consent for themselves. And we still to this day really struggle with research with children. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Yes. And so the coming timeline is by no means meant to be exhaustive, but I wanted to take the time to review some historical examples. Many of these are chronicled in the book, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. And so we will begin with the era of slavery. The purpose of going through these following studies is to demonstrate a continued and an accepted practice of using slaves for experimentation to advance um, understanding of conditions and surgical techniques. So Dr. Sims is largely accredited for advancing the field of gynecology as he perfected his technique for repairing vesicovaginal fistulas. He did not provide pain medication typically. Dr. Hamilton looked at the effects of heat stroke. He did this by repeatedly exposing slave John Brown to extreme heat and testing various treatments on him until Mr. Brown would lose consciousness from heat exhaustion. Dr. McDowell practiced surgical techniques on slaves. Dr. Long is accredited for discovering anesthesia. He did this by experimenting on slave men and women and performing surgeries, sometimes even on healthy patients to understand the effects of the anesthetic. And yet again, I will continue to contextualize the history that we will begin continue to hear about. So we move into the Jim Crow era. This was a period in time where laws were developed with the purpose of ensuring that black people remained as second class citizens. These negative connotations about black people extended beyond politics and into medicine. There was no focus or emphasis, emphasis on educating black patients about conditions or involving them in their care decisions. This was a common theme. For instance, Dr. Corson spoke to the indifference of black patients toward treat, treatment for syphilis. He doubted if black people cared enough to follow up on a treatment regimen. And so, as many of you documented Tuskegee, it was a study that spanned decades, decades. It investigated the natural history of syphilis among a group of black males. While none were inoculated with syphilis, they were not consented for the study or offered standards of care for treatment at that time, which were heavy metals. In 1939, the Negro Project was instituted by the Birth Control Federation of America, now called Planned Parenthood. Its advocate, Margaret Sanger, pictured here, fought for increased access to birth control. Unfortunately though, Dr. Sanger's proposed educational program for the South that would result in black led and run clinics was denied as the, gov the government had a larger goal in mind to decrease the population of Southern blacks due to high tax burden. This was meant to be achieved through limiting education and employing white physicians that promoted the sterilization of population. 
And within this timeline, I have to note, in 1943, penicillin was established as a treatment and cure for syphilis. The Tuskegee experiment will continue on for approximately 30 more years without treatment offered to their patients, quote unquote. Unfortunately, even after penicillin was established as a cure for syphilis, experiment experimentation on marginalized groups continued. The goal now, to understand the best dose and route. So in 1946, Dr. Coulter, the STD expert and public health service as assistant surgeon general, started a syphilis study in Guatemala in which he inoculated male prisoners and sex workers initially. But when that didn't work, he moved on to patients in a mental health facility. And when that became too difficult, he moved on to orphan children. This was of course, without the consent or understanding of any of the populations involved. Institutions agreed to the studies as they were promised much needed and valuable supplies. And as we move into the civil rights era, I first want to highlight that during this time, black and white patients continue to receive different care at hospitals. This separate and unequal treatment allowed for race-based patient care practices to continue to develop. Hamrata Lax, as many of you mentioned, Hila Sells, she was a black woman treated at Johns Hopkins for her cervical cancer. Without her knowledge or consent, her cells were taken and used for research. And as many of you noted, and Dr. Bourbon noted, the continued sterilization of many marginalized groups. So in 1960, there was an expansion of family planning clinics in predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods. This was followed by increased reports of forced sterilization of black Native American and Latino women. For example, in 1961, civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hammer presented for an appendectomy and later learned she was given a hysterectomy without her consent. This practice became so common that it was deemed the Mississippi appendectomy. So women would enter for a minor procedure and later learn, and later they would learn that they were also given either tubal ligation or hysterectomies. So as you can see, concern that may have developed throughout the years with undergoing surgical procedures is effect, can affect us today. It is estimated by the Indian Health Association that 25% of women ages 15 to 44 between the time of 1960 and 70s were either sterilized, either without their knowledge, proper education on what the procedure involved, or with coercion. Such reports are met with anecdotes of patients returning years later, requesting the new uterus that they were previously promised as they were ready to expand their family. These studies occurred, the, the following studies occurred after the passing of the Civil Rights Act, which made Jim Crow illegal. Unfortunately, the prior teachings of race-based medicine continued to influence care in 1968. A survey performed here in the Bay Area found that 75 of 90 X-ray techs used higher doses of radiation on their black patients due to beliefs of harder, denser bone and thicker skin. This study was repeated and supported in other parts of America as well. And screening, that's always good, right? In 1970s, the sickle cell screening started. Sounds great. So this was mandated screening for black patients only, although we now know sickle cell disease can affect other populations. But unfortunately, this screening process resulted in an increase in the denial rates for insurance and increased insurance rates themselves for black patients, as well as firing of employees and ban from military service in some cases. And so finally, we end our timeline in 1972 with the end of Tuskegee. And here we have Herman Shaw, a victim of the experiments shown here besides President uh, Clinton in 1997 during an apology. So as we saw, saw during our poll, most of the common knowledge studies are regarding sterilization of women, Tuskegee and syphilis studies, and Henrietta Lacks and HeLa cells. So how much of this history is common knowledge? Okay, is it something that we learned throughout our experience in medicine? Or is it something that our patients are, are currently coming to the situation knowing and understanding? So a study was performed to try to answer that question and they used Tuskegee as an example as is the most widely taught historical medical injustice. This telephone survey found that very few black and white patients had heard of the Tuskegee study. However, in that same study with the same population, 
when asked, could a study like Tuskegee occur today in our healthcare system? Black participants were two times more likely to believe a study like this could occur in current times. So what explains these differences in beliefs? So the next question is, are there additional current events that can help explain this mistrust beyond the historical events that we know to be true? And so social media has allowed people to share their personal stories to a wide audience in many ways, including real time. So Dr. Susan Moore, a family medicine doctor, presented to the ED with respiratory symptoms in the setting of COVID and chronicled her story on Facebook in real time. She posted videos advocating for pain medication and additional testing. She was eventually given a patient advocate as she was deemed as intimidating the nurses and a CT was eventually negotiated. The CT did demonstrate she had multiple PEs and medial sinus widening. Dr. Moore was admitted to the hospital. Unfortunately, during this fight, she would later pass away. And social media has all, also been a means of past stories coming to light. I was recently, just the other day, alerted to the story of Bruce Tucker. As a black man, he, he's a black man that served as the first heart transplant donor in the American South in 1968. Unfortunately, despite having his brother's card in his wallet, his family was not contacted for consent prior to the procedure. His family was unaware he had served as a donor until the funeral home informed them that Mr. Tucker did not have a heart or kidneys. And so after seeing this story on Instagram, I went straight to the comments to found approximately 172 comments, largely echoing the following sent sentiments. Wow, this is horrific, but I'm so grateful to learn this story. Confirms so much of what I already know about the history of medical community's relationship to black folk here in the US. This is why more blacks are not organ donors. My grandparents kept saying, they will let you die to take what they can. As a healthcare provider, they still would try to do it if you don't have a family member who knows healthcare. Trust and believe they would. I threw that in for free. And celebrities have come forward to share their experiences in healthcare. Serena Williams shared her experience in Vogue. In 2017, she shared that despite, um, during her hospitalization for the birth of her daughter, Olympia, she thought she was going to die. Despite having a history of DVT, when she voiced her symptoms and concerns, they were ignored. Four surgeries later, including two for her pulmonary embolism and one for complications um, secondary to like her abdominal suturing um, ripping open from coughing, she did survive that ordeal. And so in the last few years, we have also seen and experienced a rise in protests associated against police brutality. While seemingly an issue outside of medicine, recent work has shown a connection between negative interactions with law enforcement with the mistrust of the medical system. A 2018 web-based survey of adults in urban areas demonstrated that experiences with perceived unnecessary police encounters resulted in participants reporting more negative perceptions of providers and healthcare organizations. They, they concluded that experiences of perceived racism in other settings can impact scrutiny toward the healthcare system and shape expectations of unfair treatment. And this has been supported also in other environments, such as the rural areas of, among the Latino population and neighborhood environments. And so when reading this study, I began to think about some of my experiences in the ED as a consult resident, typically a place in the hospital where there is often police presence and think about the role that it may have played in some of my patient interactions. And so one of my personal experiences with this came with a patient at the general. During my assessment, the police continued to come into the trauma bay to question the patient, each time ruining the rapport that we were gaining with one another. I could literally see him becoming more and more uncomfortable with me and questioning the treatment plan. At one point, he stated that the police and I were working together and he began to consider refusing care for his femur fracture. So at this point, I'm mid-traction pen. We've agreed, we're gonna do it. I'm literally, I'm, I cannot remember who's there with me, but someone else is there with me. Thank you. You can tell us we're, we're mid-traction pen and we're, we're really trying to you know, help this guy because we know that traction pen is gonna stabilize him for the time being. And the police continue to come in. 
it took me demanding that the police not only leave the room, but also not return, that the patient began to engage with me again. It is my personal feeling that he saw this as advocating for him, and he began to distinguish between me and the police in which he was engaging with. Okay, so as we move into discussing how medical mistrust uh, that we spent the first half of the talk talking, uh, talking about affects patient outcomes, I wanted to first share how medical mistrust is measured. This multi-atom scale has been validated among patients undergoing procedures and in clinic settings. The purpose of this slide is not for you to attempt to read through all of the questions. So, <laughs> relief. <laughs> but it's to understand that there are a variety of questions that are asked in these studies. And from these answers, themes are typically described and an index is created. An example of such themes has been identified here. So such themes like suspicion, group disparities, and lack of support from healthcare workers or providers. And gradually we are beginning to understand that disparities in patient outcomes have a variety of inputs. A group of these metrics has been described as social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are a complex as a set of predictor variables that impact patient outcomes. Some of them are summarized in this diagram. And within the diagram, you can see here medical mistrust, but however, look at all of these in inputs that can then go into medical mistrust that then can then affect a patient's health and therefore affect their outcome. So overall, medical mistrust has been shown to be predictive of lower utilization of healthcare, failure to take medical advice, failure to keep follow-up appointments, postponing receiving care, failure to fill prescriptions, higher rate of patient dissatisfaction, and lower participation in research. However, with any of these talks where we talk about how social issues impact patient outcomes, it is important to see the numbers as the disparities created by medical mistrust are stark and powerful. As we go through the next few slides, the purpose is to show this. I will purposely belabor this point to show the negative impact that medical mistrust has on patient outcomes. Many of these are not surgical studies, as unfortunately much, much of this work has focused on cancer and screening and primary care, and there is much work to be done by us and our other surgical colleagues to advance this field. So many of the studies focus on the likelihood to undergo screening that can lead to a cancer diagnosis. So patients with higher mistrust are eight and a half times less likely to undergo prostate screening, three times less likely to undergo routine checkup. And women with higher trust are 400% more likely to undergo mammogram for breast cancer screening. So all of this supporting higher mistrust, um, lack of cancer screening. In other studies, look at delays in care that lead to a delayed diagnosis of chronic conditions, such as high blood pressure and heart disease, as black men in particular have higher death rates from heart disease and more is set to be understood why that occurs. So we have 100% more likely delay in cholesterol testing, 160% more likely delay in routine checkups, and 200% more likely delay um, in blood pressure testing with a higher mistrust. And because I know it's been some time since we've done some medicine, all of these things are testing measures that go into the preventative care that are important to decrease the risk and rate of negative cardiac outcomes. And what about type of care utilized and its cost? When this study controlled for socioeconomic status and insurance, because in the back of some of your minds may think, well, how do I know that this isn't due to lack of access of care or poverty? And so this is what this study made sure to control for. Medical mistrust was al alone was still found to be significant. And so a higher mis mistrust leads to an almost 1.5 higher utilization of the ED as the site of usual care. So this means that instead of presenting to a PCP or a specialty care doctor, patients end up in the ED. And the utilization of primary care and higher utilization, sorry, and the underutilization of primary care and the higher utilization of the emergency department visits that are linked to mistrust comes at a high cost. 
70% of these visits were for urgent or emergent conditions. So patients with higher mistrust present worse clinically and with a lower quality of life. ED visits are five times more expensive than primary care visit. And so in ED, so patients with higher mistrust also carry a higher financial cost of care. And so yet again, even when controlling for socioeconomic status and access to care, patients with higher mistrust, and we know mistrust is lead to a delayed in preventative care, a presenting at a worse clinical state and carrying a higher financial burden. And so in order to begin to understand medical mistrust and why it exists and how it persists thus far, we have discussed the historical context of medical mistrust and past injustices with our timeline, looked at current events and how shared stories demonstrate injustices continue to exist with stories like Dr. Moore and Serena Williams, and connected discrimination and perceptions of discrimination in institutions like the police force and solace effects on healthcare, like our, like our the study I showed looking at police um, brutality and also my personal anecdote with my traction pin. And so now we turn to the patients and look at the patient perception of discrimination and how it contributes to medical mistrust and thus affects patient outcomes. And one of the benefits of the research, uh, of the research in this field of medical mistrust has been the use of focus groups. So I felt compelled to use many of their quotes within this talk. I notice when I'm with the um, when I'm at the receptionist area, the receptionist seems more willing to chit chat with the white clients that come through than they are with me. They'll have them standing there and talking and laughing and joking. And when I step up and make a comment, you know, it's all business. I feel <laughs> I feel like they're prejudiced. When marginalized patients are treated differently, doubt in the system is created. This doubt can and does begin prior to the exam room. Every member of the office is seen as part of the healthcare system and contribute to medical mistrust. I think it's because I'm a black woman. I do not get no medication, no kind of other kind of treatment. So I'm saying, I think it's kind of an issue because you got white druggies, there are all kinds of people who are druggies, but they suspect that African-American. Marginalized patients are more likely to make to report communication difficulties with their physicians. This includes concerns that their symptoms or feelings are being dismissed, and they need to constantly and consistently assert themselves. Physicians have been shown to be more verbally dominant in phrase and length of speech when it comes to caring for Black patients. It was more or less just being rushed out as quickly as possible. It's as though when they see an African-American come in there, it's like we're trying to get over, and that's the impression I get every time. It's a little upsetting. And so we all know the limitations and the frustrations that we ourselves as care providers have with the short visits in clinics. And shorter appointments can lead to concerns that care is not being personalized and patients are being objectified. There are also feelings of lack of advocacy and support from physicians. Given the historical context of experiment, experimentation that we've reviewed, the connection can be made that concerns of objectification can add to mistrust. And so being an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon and given my audience, I sought out orthopedic studies focused on mistrust and patient outcomes. And I have to tell you, the field is certainly lacking, as we know, and as we mentioned before. But I was able to find some work done within the pediatric spine study literature. And so, as many of you know, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis has evidence-based non-operative treatment. However, these are only effective with early diagnosis and early intervention. And so this study looked at differences in presentation based on insurance status and race of patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And so they looked at when the patient presented to their orthopedic surgeon, what was their current state um, and the measurement of their curve and um, what were the insurance or race based factors that impacted that. And so the overall conclusion was that black patients with public insurance were 60 times less likely to present with a curve, um, sorry, present with a curve less than 40 degrees. 
And so the impact of that is curve, the degree of curvature dictates operative or non-operative management. So the impacts of presenting with a larger curve can mean the difference between operative and non-operative management, which completely changes the outcome of the patient. Another study sought to quantify the effect of patient perceptions, mistrust, and patient outcomes. In a group of patients with sickle cell disease, experiences with discrimination increased likelihood of non-adherence to recommendations by 53%. So even if we were able to have our patients show up and we're able to spend time with them, there is still a risk given medical to medical mistrust that we will not be able to impact their outcome. And so this is where we are. We've established that patients from marginalized communities have a higher context for medical mistrust, which is then reinforced by current events and perceptions of discrimination, which can then impact health outcomes. Now what? Now what can we do as physicians to, re to reduce these barriers to care and help our patients? And so we're gonna go back to our poll. And I want you to think about your last difficult patient. How would you describe their actions and behavior? So we have scared, skeptical, confrontational, suspicious, persistently skeptical, demanding, did not allow provider to touch them, angry about the long wait, justifiably, justifiably confused by our complicated system, irrational, demanding, emotional, probably for both of you, aggressive, angry, frustrating, fearful, anger and not engaging in conversation, verbose, <laughs> yes, <laughs> angry, confrontational, fearful, entitled, justified, angry. So as you can see, we, we have some themes here as patients present and our experiences as physicians with how they're presenting. And so actually I'm gonna stay here because we're gonna do our next question is, what are some of the reactions from yourself or staff or the healthcare system that has occurred because of these actions and behaviors? So what happened? They were angry, they were verbose, they were justifiably angry, and then what? Dismissal, defensive medicine, advent against medical advice, curt, possibly the provider was curt or even the patient was. We practice defensive medicine. Prejudice results from these behaviors, dismissal, tried to PR in agitation, to P, so uh, as needed agitation medications, longer time spent caring for this patient, inability to provide adequate care, smile and nod, not really listening, order more tests, frustration, self-frustration,
lack of care and empathy, guarded. And maybe that means possibly both people. A Bert, I think that's when they flee, right? I think that's possibly. Risk, risk mitigation, disengagement, victim blame. Apathy. Now you're angry or the system's angry or the staff is angry, everyone's angry. And then the feeling of defeat. Okay. So now this was kind of a little bit of experimentation because I didn't want to tell you how patients present because you all know it. We're all in there. We see patients every day and we experience this and we have reactions to it. But now I'm going to show you what we see in the literature. So patients with a higher medical mistrust can present with frustration. Many of you wrote that down. Anger, questioning. So maybe that's the patient that speaks longer or takes longer or question cares. Indifference to care, non-compliance, request for data. So maybe that's the difficult patient that asks for too much, it appears. Presents with a family or support system. So maybe that's someone who never comes alone or doesn't want to be alone or is constantly asking that you call their parents or their family on rounds when you know you only have five minutes to do to see 15 patients. Missed appointments. And so those are those dismissal forms that we see. And so I just wanted to kind of have you guys see that this is not just the data showing this. It's, these are things that we're experiencing. But I'm going to spend the last portion of this talk, hopefully in a more positive nature, as I think it's always important with these talks to kind of hit you hard, get the emotions there. We're feeling really heavy right now, but it's okay because the reason why we're in this field is because we're solution oriented, we're goal oriented, and we fix things. All right. So this is where we could be, and this is where we all can get to. So race, sex, concordant care. And what does that mean? So one solution is this. The idea is simple, match patients with providers that look like them. Um, and by matching based on demographics, multiple studies have investigated this topic. The results are that patients have been shown to demonstrate higher levels of trust by improved communication, increased adherence to treatment plan, and improved patient satisfaction. Some of these studies hypothesize that this is secondary to longer time spent with patients and better interpersonal communication. But, you know, even as we look around the room, we may realize that this is not a reality that we currently have. Because in regards to race concordant and care, some of the limitations are the low rates of minority physicians. And so if you look at the AAMC statistics from a few, from I think two years ago, this is, the medical field of physicians is based upon about 17% Asian, 6% Hispanic, 5% Black, 36% female, and 3% LGBTQAI. And that 3% is very uncertain, as, as you may know, that it may be difficult for people in certain positions to disclose this information. And we haven't even touched on intersectionality. And so therefore, without an increase in the diversity of medicine, this cannot occur. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I hit the mouse, it's not there. And we are not able to actually put into effect race concordant care and study its effects. Therefore, as we diversify the field of medicine, we must also ensure that all providers are being equipped with cultural competency curriculum. And it's important that we are still holding all providers accountable to take care of a diversity of patients. And so of course, at the medical school level, this is happening, but we need to make sure it's happening at all schools and not just schools like UCSF or University of Rochester. And then on a, attending, on a resident and attending level, this can also become a routine part of our department expectations like we have done with our implicit bias training here, but also at specialty meetings. 
So when, you know, as we go to specialty meetings, when is the last time that there has been a talk or even a small discussion on these topics? We need to make that a practice. As we can see, advancing techniques and technology is important, but this is also important as well. However, some evidence does show that race and coordinating care has not shown to increase patient satisfaction. And it is actually patient-centered communication that is what makes the difference. So there are six components to patient-centered care, understanding of individual preferences, empathy, shared goal setting and decision-making, active listening, open-ended questions and reflective conversations, and involvement of family and friends. So I guess I wanna go back to the active listening to our, to our, as we know, and we all do, the smell and nod, right? So are you really listening to those patient symptoms? and their complaints? Or have we just heard them say one word and looked at the X-ray and already diagnosed them and decided the treatment plan based upon our decision? When they're talking about their pain and their disability, are we showing empathy? Are we acknowledging that it is hard and that their pain is real? At the same time, telling them that unfortunately we still might not be, 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 be able to have a solution. And are we understanding individual preferences? Or like I said, have we already determined what the treatment plan is before we even walked into the room? And so I would argue that race and coordinate care and patient-centered communication both make sense. And maybe what we are seeing in some of the above studies is that this patient-centered care occurs more naturally with a race or a sex or just demographic and coordinate care. A medical provider who is skilled in informing showing respect and supporting patient involvement may be able to mitigate concerns or perceptions of racial differences to establish a connection to the patient. Therefore, we must can also consider the utilization of these techniques. So how can we do this? The following are just a few ways to implement this patient-centered care into practice, particularly when met with mistrust. So using em empathy, not information. So this technique has been employed in the pediatric population with patients who decline vaccination. As clinicians, our instinct is to provide facts, give them the information, let them see everything on the table. However, we must first empathize and understand where that patient is coming through with active listening. And this may not be done in the first conversation. So encouraging and providing time for second or third conversations offering the follow-up with the patient at another time can assist with prior reports of patients feeling rushed. So acknowledging, unfortunately today I only have this amount of time, but we can book a follow-up appointment at this date. Or when would you like to follow up with me? It can also serve as a way to build patient report in a short time period. As typically as orthopedic surgeons, we are not following these patients for the length of time, as such as a primary care physician. Utilizing um, health tools also assists in decreasing communication barriers and allowing for family involvement. So it allows them, maybe without their family being there, to feel as if they can show this information and share the treatment plan with their family members. And demonstrating patient advocacy. So think about and acknowledge the patient's concerns. Do they have a complaint about you that they're talking to you about? Own it, think about it, consider it. Think about ways you can address other factors that may add to the provider bias of this patient. So we've all seen the dreaded pop-up, the warning, patient encounter, aggressive patient, patient encounter, dismissed. Okay, you know, these are valid in terms of you think about, I guess, safety, but at the same time, is that also changing your perception about, about the patient and how they're presenting? And for how long of a time do we actually need these warnings and who are they really for? And so we have to think about even the positive and negative impact of our documentation. This is a pleasant 65 year old female. Sounds trivial, but maybe when someone else sees that pop up and then reads your note, or we talk extensively and the patient was able to explain to me why they were not able to make these appointments and list them. So even though as we talked about in our m, &M how documentation is important for medical legal purposes, it can also serve as a way to communicate to other providers that this patient either has more going on 
or allows them to move beyond the pop-ups or the other practices that we have in place that may bias them against the patient. It has also been shown that one of the many benefits of shared decision aids is that they can improve a patient's trust in their physicians. So some of the studies that I found were predominantly in the joints and spine literature on the use of shared decision aids. And most of them involved either sending patients a flyer, using models in the clinic, or um, going through a computer-based model or video about what the surgery or procedure would be. And so this allows further avenue of communication and understanding of what is going to be done to the patient. Again, there is a history of non-consent, non-consenting procedures done to patients. So we have to be clear and explicit about what we are doing, and especially in our practice in which we are inserting devices into patients. And lastly, I'd like to add the importance of healthcare systems to add to the narrative. Um, as mentioned before, many of these studies were done with community partnerships as not, not only informs the studies, but also gives the participants additional interaction with the healthcare provider. So more positive interactions hopefully will help us move past this mistrust. It also gives us an opportunity to display and share the work we are doing as providers to improve. As you all sit here at this talk, as you all have attended certain lectures and certain trainings, we need to display that. We need to show patients that we as a group are acknowledging and owning the history, but we as a group also are moving forward and trying to push past these barriers. One thought I had was even at our, as patients walk into our orthopedic institute, we have a screen that displays quotes from providers and things like that. And maybe we should also ensure that there's, cons there's consistent updates about the work we are being done within this field to reassure patients. Other ways that places have done is adding something as simple as adding more diverse pictures to, um, to the walls of different areas, even like we've done at, um, on Seven Long and Parnassus. And so as in this talk, I need to acknowledge that I'm aware that I've omitted a lot of information in this field. And in particular, much of the history and much of the work that is done have focused on the Black American experience. It is not my goal to diminish the injustices and the marginalized care that other populations receive. However, many of the books and the studies I looked at are typically looking at Black versus white. And so that even tells you we need to do more work of looking at the immigrant experience, other marginalized community experience, in San Francisco alone, we have a large homeless population, our psychiatric patients. Unfortunately, the list of marginalized patients is not short, and therefore we can do more work to understand how they're presenting and why. And most of, most of this work focuses on primary and non-surgical care. And as I stated many times, and I'll say it again, we need to do more. However, I hope this serves as the beginning of the conversation on this talk and not the end. And so in summary, yes, medical mistrust exists and is based on historical and current events. Yes, these patients are presenting worse with, and with worse outcomes secondary to medical mistrust. But even in the setting of this, we can and we must push past these barriers and we can still provide relationships and build trust, okay, amongst these patients. So I hope I've left you with a positive. And if not, I'll leave you with something even more positive. My amazing an everlasting support system here at UCSF. A huge thank you to Dr. Zimmel, Metz, and Dieb for going through my presentation with me and looking at outlines and sending me articles and suggestions and food for thought and always providing interesting conversation. I have been well fed here during my time at UCSF with amazing dinners and advice and information by my, of course, amazing, amazing additional mentors, Dr. Sabatini, Ding, Dr. Bourbon, and Wistrak. As you can see here, yes, we were indeed at a concert, and yes, it was indeed dope. And sorry, Dr. Hansen, I could not find a picture with you in it. He was there too. <laughs> and then, of course, got to shout out the best class of UCSF. You know, I may be slightly biased, and if you don't believe we're the best class, we're at least the best looking. Okay. <laughs> and lastly, but not least, of course, the Dr. Jefferson, who has skipped his own education in emergency medicine to come listen to this talk. Thank you so much for listening to me, give it, and dealing with me frustratingly <laughs> taking some of your notes. And with that, I will end.
Great, thank you, Dr. Baldwin Jefferson. Uh, congratulations, that was a great talk and uh, clearly on a very important topic. Um, we probably have just a couple minutes for questions, comments, um, can pass around a microphone, or if anyone on Zoom has thoughts, feel free to unmute also. Thank you, Aviana, for um, an excellent talk and good historical background in education. I think it's working. Um, one thing I thought about a lot um, now that I'm back at the county are is the medical mistrust for those patients specifically. And uh, as I was reading through your kind of how we can address some of that mistrust, I was thinking what things I can do for those patients. More oftentimes, it's like the late night 1 a.m. consults that you're trying to convinced to go to surgery it's in five hours, um, which is just, I know for myself, like really building the trust to convince somebody that they need surgery in that short amount of time is difficult. I don't know if you had any thoughts for looking through the ways you thought about in the OI, how we can do it and like UC side, but also in those like difficult encounters late night, whether it's from a systemic side or just the consul resident themselves, like a couple of times I've come back at like 5.30 just before rounds and then got the consent or like other examples you have? Yeah, I didn't see, like I mentioned, most of it's in like a clinic setting, but my personal opinion of it is a little bit of owning the situation. So I tell patients often, like I, you know, reading the room, I can tell we're not going, you know, we're not having a, a positive relationship right now. Why is that? Or hey, you know, this experience happened to me and this is how I dealt with it. This is how you can deal with it. And so I feel like trying to, and this this was shown within it, seeing build beyond going past the labels and seeing people as people. And so they're not necessarily seeing you as a person who they have, they just met 10 minutes ago and you're telling them now they need a surgery that they don't really quite understand. And they're probably also sleep deprived and traumatized by the experience that they just went through they're now hopefully saying, okay, yeah, I do own this statement. And maybe they don't even recognize that they're behaving this way or they're feeling this way. So you give, you kind of help them communicate those words to them. I see that you are skeptical of what I'm saying. Why is that? I see that you're frustrated with what I'm doing and the care I'm providing. How can we move past that? And so I just think even those simple things, because I think we can really go in one-sided, like we've been there 1 a.m., look at the x-ray, clearly you've already filled out the consent, you've already signed it, you had your, you had your co-resident sign it in the room, you've already dated it, you're ready to go. You already called it, heck, you already booked the case and told JD the implants. I know it, we know it, we've all done it. <laughs> and so now, now we have to go, okay, I know, I know the treatment plan, I already know it, but at the same time, do I know it? Have I had that discussion with the patient? Wonderful, wonderful talk. Continue to learn so much from you and the information you provided. Um, one thing that you brought up was those warning signs when patient charts get open. And even in the past year, that was done as a retaliatory action towards one of my patients and just completely falsely said that a black female patient had used drugs in the hospital. And I want to just in, empower listen to Dr. Baldwin's words and empower all of you to question these things when they don't make sense, because sometimes they're just false. And it's okay to call up people and say, are we being biased towards this patient's discharge plan? Are we being fair to this patient? Because we are all busy. And I think sometimes we just believe what we hear, what nursing tells us, what case management tells us, because we have to work as a team. But if something doesn't feel right, it's okay to call it out. We actually had that removed. We brought it up with nurse management and we said, this is just false. And they said, oh, it was put in by accident. Okay, I don't, For, so I, every single person interacts with patients and once that's on the chart, it's really going to negatively affect them in forever. And so I think just to your point, when you're saying how you document, but then calling out things that don't make sense can really, help prevent future discrimination against patients. And this is this is happening now, even at UCSF, right? A very progressive DEI friendly institution. So you, you all have a lot of power to really positively impact how people are treated. And I would like also like to add, um, being mindful how we're presenting patients to one another. So we as residents can really impact whether even 
a patient is indicated for surgery. So have you, how long have you really spoken with the patient to really understand how their social status is gonna impact their outcome? We do know it impacts their outcome, but how can we present the patient and to make sure that we're actually having this nuanced discussion and quick judgments or treatment plans aren't being made? All right, I think, oh, um, we should probably wrap up if okay. Um, we're Sorry, almost I went 10 minutes long. past. Sorry. Uh, but um, congratulations again. Sorry, um, thank you, and um, thank you all for being here. Thanks.